Um, my name is uh, Greer Luce. I serve as the Chief Communications Officer at the New Jersey Historical Commission. And it's my pleasure to um, welcome everyone to Building an Audience for Accessible Digital Programs, um, which is the first in a series of webinars that the Historical Commission is hosting in partnership with the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Um, and this webinar series is called Advancing Your Mission during COVID-19 and beyond. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Angela Speakman, who serves as Director of Development and Communications at the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Hi, and welcome everyone. Um, we appreciate uh, your participation today and look forward to exploring um, some questions and topics that are really affecting uh, nonprofits and frankly everyone else throughout the region. Um, a lot of how the webinar series came to be was really um, in response to survey information. Um, and I think that this is, this is such a great opportunity for us to come together. Um, and so I'd like to turn this over to our, um, our two executive directors, Sarah Curitan from the New Jersey Historical Commission and Karen Berkowitz from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Um, Karen, would you like to uh, provide a welcome for everyone? Sure. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet with all of you today, albeit virtually. It'd be more of a pleasure to do it in person, but we all know that's off the table for a while. Um, I am so glad that we were able to work with the Historical Commission to bring this series of webinars uh, to all of you because I just think New Jersey has the most amazing set of humanities organizations uh, and we know that everybody is struggling at the moment and we hope that through these webinars we can offer some resources um, that can help, help get us all through these tough times. Uh, We've been thinking a lot about not only what information we think would be useful, but how we can help to create collaborations or convene people who might be able to help each other. So uh, I just want to encourage everybody um, to continue this dialogue. Uh, if after this meeting, um, a really great idea occurs to you for a webinar that we haven't yet promised to you, feel free to shoot any one of us an email. Um, I think we would like to be very responsive to you. The idea for this series really kind of came out of some of the, the town hall uh, meetings that were the historical commission was convening and we were hearing people articulate a need for um, some sharing of expertise on these topics. So um, feel free to keep the ideas coming and we hope that we can help to support all of you who are doing the really great public humanities work in your communities at this very, very difficult time. Um, we would like to see everybody come out stronger and more resilient and we just cross our fingers and hope that that's where it all ends up. So um, we certainly will do everything we can to, to get us all in that direction. Um, Sarah, do you wanna, do you wanna jump in and, and say a little something here too? Absolutely, so um, I'm just delighted to welcome all of you on behalf of the New Jersey Historical Commission and of our great Secretary of State, uh, Tisha Wei. She sends her welcome as well. Um, we are delighted to be working with the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Um, on this program. It's, it's great. These, these partnerships, I think we all realize, are critical to the work that all of us do. And it's always um, a pleasure to be able to, to partner with a great organization such as the Council for the Humanities. And I just want to add that um, if, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, we all can see uh, the bad sides. We can see the damage that the pandemic has done, not just in terms of the number of, of cases and the horrific number of lives lost. But um, as with any um, uh, event in history, there are always uh, some unexpected uh, benefits. And I think one of those benefits we can see already is uh, a bursting of creativity. 
uh, particularly on digital platforms. And it's coming from all directions. We all see it every day as we turn on our computers and, and take a look at what's, what's come in uh, to, to each of us. Um, and the cultural community, both on the art side and on the, the history humanities side, is part of that burst of creativity. So um, I'm excited to hear our speakers today as they target some of those really essential um, uh, ideas and goals that we need to be, need to be considering as we now uh, really engage with digital programming. So with that, I'll turn it over, I think, to Greer, and we will get started with the program. Great. So I thought we could start today with an overview of um, today's overall presentation. Uh, I'm going to start with a few kind of housekeeping items. Um, first of all, I wanted to mention that our webinar today will be recorded and be made available um, following the conclusion of the actual um, live event. Um, so we are being recorded currently. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, you'll note that there is a Q&A chat box as well as a regular chat box. That is where we will have our Q&A portion of the presentation um, following our speakers. Um, so please um, you know, think about questions and um, feel free to put them in the Q&A box um, as we move along and we'll get to those um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, just to assure everyone, uh, we know everyone's muted, um, that's intentional, um, and uh, you will have, of course, an opportunity to share questions and comments in that Q&A box. So um, those are all the housekeeping items I think we had. Um, next, we'll move into an overview of some COVID-19 resources from the Historical Commission as well as the Council for the Humanities. And then we'll head into the, the real heart of our, our presentation today, the um, Building an Audience for Accessible Digital Programs um, webinar, and I will introduce our two speakers. We will have a questions and answers period following that, as I mentioned. And then finally, we'll conclude the presentation um, with um, some information about the presentation resources list, as well as some information about our next upcoming webinars. Thanks, Greer. Uh, appreciate the overview um, so that we know what to expect in these next uh, 80 minutes. I wanted to take the opportunity, while there are so many folks on the call, to talk a little bit about um, some of the funding resources that are available through the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. As part of the CARES Act, the National Endowment for the Humanities received an allocation of funding that was then um, passed through to the 56 state councils uh, that are across the country uh, in DC and in the territories. So those councils received funding because they are, are already um, familiar with and very much ingrained in programming, supporting the local historical and cultural infrastructure that exists um, within their own state. So in um, included in the CARES funding for NEH was this public funding that was available. And of the, the total pot, New Jersey received about $649,000. Um, so the, the council's response to that was to put together a grant opportunity, um, COVID-19 response grants, either in general operating support for organizations that are primarily public humanities organizations. These are organizations that are engaged in um, the work of public humanities, and that comes in a lot of different forms. Um, so that general operating support uh, is available, is we're currently accepting applications for that. Um, and then for organizations that might not be public humanities focused nonprofit organizations, but for, for those that had programs, any kind of project that was already in, in the works, in pro process, in play, um, you can actually request emergency funding to continue those programs. So there's lots of information on our website. And when we send out information at the conclusion of today's webinar, you'll have access to all of this. Um, but njhumanities.org is where you can find all of the eligibility 
safety requirements, all of the information, a really overwhelmingly long FAQ section, um, which is designed to provide as many responses as we're getting from organizations when it comes to questions about that funding. We're trying to keep that list as um, comprehensive and robust as possible. Um, you'll also find the actual application itself, the link for that, and we update all of that information as new, um, as new information or details arise. Our most recent announcement was that we will close this application um, as of Sunday, May 31st. So um, that we, we are accepting applications on a rolling deadline. However, we will discontinue accepting those applications um, on May 31st. So if you have any questions about that um, throughout um, the, the webinar and want to shoot either me or grants at njhumanities.org a question, we'll be sure to get that information to you. But I would say because of the high volume of requests um, the, for information and just the application and all of all of the parts that are associated with this all being done by, I have to give a plug to our Director of Grants and Programs, Gigi Naglak, and our Program Officer, James Kirkland. Um, they have been working so hard, um, as well as Anamika Kapoor, our accountant, um, to get everything together uh, in a very short amount of time. So that program is ongoing, and I would just really encourage you to review all of the information on the website um, and then contact us with any questions or concerns or anything like that. Um, and again, that application period is closing on May 31st. And I want to turn the digital mic over to Sarah so that she can talk a little bit about um, what's been going on at the commission and some resources and survey information. There we go. Um, yes, so uh, the Historical Commission has, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, worked on compiling resources for all of you. Um, and if you're like me, you probably are getting lots of emails and uh, um, other resources kind of bombarding you from different uh, organizations. So uh, really due to the good offices of Greer Loose, we have compiled uh, and curated a list of these for you. And you can find that at the New Jersey Historical Commission website, which is history.nj.gov. And um, we do update that regularly. So at the beginning of this crisis, a lot of the resources were focused um, on immediate, um, in immediate response um, and financial planning and uh, collections. As you all, so many of you know, we did do a webinar on uh, rapid response collecting in a pandemic. And now what you're gonna see is a lot of resources coming in that focus now on the reopening phase and great advice on, on uh, getting institutions back uh, and accessible to the public once again. So we really encourage you to, to uh, access that information. We love it if you share um, uh, items that maybe we've missed. We'd love to have you send them to, to us and we're, we're happy to, to expand that list and update it on a regular basis. Another initiative that the Commission has undertaken is to uh, conduct some surveys. We did one right at the beginning of the, the pandemic, um, and we have posted the, a summary of the results from that also at our website. So you can find it there under the NJHC News column on our homepage. Um, and by the way, we are going to continue collecting data about the impact of COVID-19. So we do plan a second survey. We were going to uh, release it now, but uh, we have paused for about two weeks because we, we very much want to encourage all of you to respond to the governor's survey uh, of impact that is out there right now. So um, please, I encourage all of you to respond to that survey so that your experiences and needs get, get collected on a statewide basis. 
and then look for um, a, sur a second follow-up survey from us in about a week's time towards the end of next week. So um, those are two uh, critical resources um, that we are working on and will continue to maintain and share with you throughout this crisis. And I'll hand it back to, I think, Greer. Great. Um, well, thank you, Sarah and Angela. Um, next, I thought we would go over some of the kind of big questions that are driving um, our presentation today. Um, just to, to, as a framing device as we move into the presentation itself. Um, so the three questions we um, were really looking to, to get at with this presentation today, um, the first is how are you building new audiences online while still serving existing constituents? How are you creating digital pr programs that are accessible for everyone? And how are you spreading the word about your work amidst the current health crisis? Um, so again, as Angela mentioned earlier, um, really the, um, the soul of, of this and our other webinars um, coming up um, is to address a need that we saw for um, resources and information related to, to digital programming. So today we're really going to focus on audience engagement. And it's my pleasure um, to introduce our speakers for today. Um, so our first speaker will be Kristen Giardi, um, who is the Interim Director for Development at the Newark Public Library. And I'll share a little bit of, um, of Kirsten's um, bio. Um, Kirsten is a seasoned nonprofit leader with nearly two decades of experience. Throughout her career, she has focused her talents on assisting organizations with missions to address the needs of the hardest to serve populations. In her current role as Interim Assistant Director for Development for the Newark Public Library, Kirsten oversees all aspects of fundraising, cultivating new funding streams and donor relations for New Jersey's most comprehensive public library. During her tenure at the library, she has built a reputation for her strong commitment to the community, innovative pro problem solving, and capacity to successfully execute events in support of the library that reflect our rich and diverse literary and cultural offerings. Kirsten also serves as the executive director for the Newark Public Library Foundation, where she is a key contributor to the planning, programming, and promotion of the forthcoming Philip Roth Personal Library. Prior to joining the Newark Public Library, Kirsten served as senior vice president for New Jersey operations of Goodwill Industries of Greater New York and Northern New Jersey Incorporated where she was instrumental in implementing, enhancing, and expanding programs and services designed to meet the workforce needs of individuals with disabilities, single parents, and the reentry population. So Kirsten's going to be our first speaker. And then I'm also pleased to take this time and um, share some information about our second speaker, Nicole Bellowin. Um, Nicole is the Interim Director and Public Historian in Residence at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Center for the Humanities. Nicole is a historian of disability in early America. She, um, as I mentioned, is the Acting Director of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Center for the Humanities at Rutgers Camden and is the Public Historian in Residence there. In that capacity, she directs a continuing education program in historic preservation she is also the co-editor of The Public Historian and the digital media editor, both for the National Council on Public History. Nicole regularly lectures and gives workshops on disability history and best practices for museums and historic sites. So without further ado, I'm happy to welcome uh, Kirsten Giardi. Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, it's working. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all um, virtually this morning. I want to uh, thank both the New Jersey Council for H the Humanities and the New Jersey Historical Commission for inviting the Newark Public Library to present today. 
It's an honor to be recognized by our colleagues for the work that we are doing to serve our community. And it means a great deal to us at NPL. So thank you to both Angela and Greer for this wonderful opportunity to present this morning. Um, I wanna make a quick disclaimer that uh, the information that I'm about to share is very much anecdotal and not uh, fact-based. Um, I know we're all trying to adjust to this new normal. So my intention here is to share with you our experiences at the library, what's worked, uh, what programs have actually exceeded our expectations and some of the challenges that um, we faced and are, are still kind of dealing with during this uh, intensive crash course into virtual programming. Um, so for a little background, uh, the New York Public Library closed our doors to the public at the same time that the New York Public Schools closed. Um, it was the week of March 16th. And at that point, our first directive was to be the source of information, resources, and support for our New York Public Schools students, families, and teachers. And we made a huge effort to inform them of the various resources that were available to complement their learning, strengthen their skills, and help with homework. Um, but at the same time, we were determined to share as much information as was available. There were constant updates about COVID-19. Both the governor and the mayor were holding daily briefings. There was an abundance of new resources being made available for Newark residents, such as uh, free lunches for the students, uh, where to find uh, which food banks were still available, um, there was also financial assistance for people who had trouble paying their rent and uh, free internet access. So there was a huge urgency at the library to um, also remind residents that our librarians are still available. Our, our reference desk was on call. They were trying to get out the message about their emails being available, or you could also phone them. And they also had a phone number for text as well. So it was all about sharing information, sharing resources, and um, it was quite intense, <laughs> to say the least. Information was being updated on a daily, if not hourly basis. So there was a plethora of emails that were requesting additions or changes or edits to our website and our social media posts. Um, I also, in development, we also oversee communications and marketing, which I forgot to add. So um, like my emails and my staff emails were just blowing up during the, these first two weeks. Um, and that's when I made a great call, uh, executive decision, and I asked uh, our New Jersey librarian, Beth Zach Cohen, if she could provide some social media assistance, um, which she has done in the past for some of our other events, but uh, I don't think she knew what she signed up for when she agreed to. So Beth has been working with um, Mary Gable, who is our communications marketing guru. And the two of them have been just killing it, I have to say, of keeping our website up to date, of um, sharing information, getting our calendar events out. Um, we're trying hard not to bombard people with emails, but at the same time, it's in this new virtual world, it's all about getting that message out and, and um, making sure Instagram, Twitter, and and uh, our Facebook pages are up to date. Um, so they have been doing an amazing job and I am um, very grateful for all of their assistance. Uh, they definitely are helping me to look good. So, uh, uh, and so during this time, we also realized that our, all of these great online resources that we've been promoting, they were only accessible to community members with good standing library cards. So if your library card had expired or if you hadn't gotten around to getting one, you were out of luck. Um, so we quickly created a, a new email called library cards at NPL. And uh, we, we also started promoting that and we were able to, if people provide their address and names, we provide them with a temporary three month a library card. So, and then of course, 
now that people have library cards and they can access all these great resources, we realize that some people don't really know how to use them. So our reference librarian started creating tutorials so that patrons can easily navigate our online resources like Canopy, Libby, Ancestry.com, and Learning Express. Um, so once the frenzy of uh, dispersing information started to wean a bit, our children's librarian, Allie Ross, who is pictured here with the unicorn head, she approached us about offering daily story times via Facebook Live. Um, so personally, I feel like that was sort of the spark that um, kind of served as like the pivot that we didn't have to necessarily be this platform for information and sharing of resources and that we could actually start to create our own um, content and, and start telling our own stories. So it could also be um, that, 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 that was about the last week of uh, March, I think when we kicked off our daily story time hours. And I think that was also the same time that we were kind of realizing that um, we, no one was going to be returning to normal anytime soon. Um, yeah, but I like to give credit to Allie that, uh, that she was the one who kind of gave us that boost to start making things happen. Um, another important development that was working in our favor to, pos to position ourselves um, to be able to create virtual programming was that we were already holding these weekly cross departmental staff meetings. And originally they were a little chaotic. There was full of brainstorming and kind of troubleshooting. Um, but what does make it so successful is that we have this mix of skill sets that work together to bring our ideas to fruition. So we quickly realized that Facebook Live, you know, has some major limitations and we weren't, wasn't going to be the right platform for all of our programming. And so our IT folks who are in this weekly meeting with us, they looked into purchasing Zoom business license so that now we have much more flexibility and security for all of our presentations. Um, our reference librarian started sharing questions that they were getting from our community. And so that also helped us to sort of gear like what's what's the next tutorial that we should do or, or maybe, you know, there's even enough interest that we could create a program. Um, just to give you an example of I brought up, or, you know, this was right before the census was supposed to kick off in April 1st. So I kind of brought that up that, you know, the library, we were hoping to have all these in person programs and really encourage patrons to complete their forms. And so, you know, to sort of, I sort of just threw that out to the group that, you know, maybe we want to do something for the census. And from that one little mention, we had three programs that have like popped up um, and they're all really different, which is, which is such, which is what is so great. Um, the first one that came up was the importance of accurate census data for genealogists and historians. Um, and then we did another one about the historical evidence of the evolution of Newark using the data that was collected by the census. And actually next week we're hosting a program in partnership with Deputy Mayor Quiles to promote census participation among Spanish speaking Latino communities in Newark. So out of one idea, like three very diverse different programs were created and, you know, and we're hitting different areas of our communities. Um, and given the importance of the, um, of the census, I, I'm sure that there will be more. Oh, and uh, thanks to my colleague who is reminding me to say that next week's program is uh, actually in Spanish. So that's what makes it also different than the other two. Um, let's see. Another important develop, development that helped, uh, sorry, sorry. Okay, too many notes. <laughs> sorry, I'm a little nervous too. I don't know why. Thank God you, I can't see you all. <laughs> so what I found extra special about this multi-talented group is everyone's willingness to share ideas and support each other. Um, and their willingness to go out on a limb and try something totally new. Our special collections staff 
Tom, Dale, and Nadine have been amazing at creating new content. Um, they've been providing in-depth tours of our fine prints collection or an ancient manuscripts, old city maps, and precious phot photographs. They've also used this opportunity to connect with local authors, artists, historians, musicians, professors, doctors, and community leaders to provide different perspectives on this challenging time. We've also attempted to provide entertainment types of activities by hosting uh, virtual dance parties and open mic nights, as well as enrichment programs that del delve into jazz, genealogy, and New York-centric topics. Our teen librarians are offering arts and crafts family trivia, and team-oriented programs that integrate history, culture, and art. We organize virtual college tours. We are providing help with college essays. And uh, we, just last night, we hosted a program that explores the fears that many college-bound teens experience. Um, in order to engage our community members, we've incorporated our weekly, our Saturday, community story hour, and we invite our neighbors to submit videos of themselves reading a children's book. And these videos are updated to our Facebook page and they preview every Saturday at 11 and 2. And we have stories in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, which is just awesome because that's our community. Um, other attempts uh, to include our community were on National Nurses Day. We asked everyone to submit a picture of their favorite nurse and uh, our IT folks like spent hours making this very, really uh, touching video that we shared on Facebook as well. Um, and for the Great Poetry Reading Day, we received like 25 to 30 entries of people just sharing their favorite poem and, um, and, and reading poetry on that day, which is nice because it also, not only is it wonderful that they're sharing with us, it's also showing us that they're paying attention to what we're asking and they are, um, they're submitting things for us to share as well. So it's been a wonderfully collaborative work environment. And I think we all realize how lucky we are to have such a creative, motivated, and committed team that is always looking for new ways to serve and engage our community. So it's interesting. When, um, when Angela shared with me one of the areas to focus on was um, to talk about accessibility, I immediately thought, uh, about our, our digital divide that we have in Newark and I'm sure many other urban areas. So um, we, it, I wanna give a shout out to our social worker. Um, she very quickly decided that she wanted to support the community by um, providing online counseling services, but immediately she, uh, like reach, she was, saying that, you know, her email was not, was not going to work and that we needed to, um, we needed to give her a Google phone number so that one, she can retain her privacy, but she was very aware that a lot of the people who would be reaching out for her services were probably not going to have access to computers or possibly not the internet. Um, so it's, so with her Google phone number, people are able to call her or text her and she can respond to them. Um, we try really, really hard to make sure that all of our programs are, um, whether they be Zoom meetings, Facebook Live meetings, we always rebroadcast on both Instagram and YouTube. And we try to make sure that they're accessible via a laptop, a tablet, or a smartphone. But um, realistically, we, we understand that we are not reaching all of our community. And that's, that's an area for us to improve. So uh, we, are, we are offering ASL classes on a weekly basis, but that's another area that we have room for improvement. Um, we just recently started using a Zoom feature. Uh, I think we've tried it now twice on our programs where you can actually do a live translation. I, once was um, during the program, we had someone speaking, translating in, it in Spanish. And then I believe uh, we 
rebroadcast one of our um, one of our theater events, and we were able to sort of uh, to give a, a Spanish translation for that. So we haven't yet used that for ASL. Um, I'm not sure how that will work, but that's definitely on my list of things to do. We're also looking at um, Google Meet and Microsoft Team. Our IT uh, folks have been telling us how they have the closed caption options available. Um, their concern is that the closed captions are not always very accurate, but it might be better than nothing. And if and so, what we don't know is whether or not if we rerun a uh, previously recorded video, if the closed captions will work. So that is something that they actually are working on this week to sort of figure out if we could um, if we could move forward and get some of our more of our programs a little more accessible for our our deaf and hard of hearing. Um, the other thing, oh, so I about uh, expanding our audience. Uh, I seem to have jumped to that. Um, we just started trying out. So again, we are still newbies, but we've just started paying for um, Facebook booths. So I got a little tutorial from our IT team this morning. Um, so a boost is a something you can add to one of your posts, your Facebook posts, and if, if it's not getting a ton of likes, Facebook sort of makes it kind of disappear and it doesn't get a, a ton of attention. I, so if you pay like three to five dollars to boost that, it actually, it, it makes it be super important to Facebook. And so, you know, the next 500 to 1000 people that are looking at something library related, census related, um, uh, any other uh, our other topics, they, then the, the, this post will show up in their feed. So the, the couple times that they've done it, we've a post that started out with like 30, only 30 views has been um, punched up to about almost a thousand views with that extra three dollar investment. So we're still we're still in the very um, infantile stages there and I haven't quite figured out how that's going to work but I'm hoping that we are going to be able to use this option um, to strategically help us increase our audience. Um, we've also been approached since everyone here is a nonprofit there is uh, Google has a ten thousand dollar kind of scholarship for you to use Google ads um, and we've been approached by a company called Kios. It's K-I-O-I-S, um, and they are they are uh, experts at really helping libraries uh, capitalize on that Google offer of of free Google Ads. So again, we just finished doing the paperwork with them, so I don't even know if they've even used any of our ads yet. But that's another area um, that we're exploring to try to expand our audience as well. And I'm actually, I'm excited about this one because I feel like uh, over the past, you know, almost two months, we have some really good data, strong baseline data for what we have been able to perform without these Google ads. So it will be interesting. I think it will be a really um, informative to see how much extra views or clicks um, that we're able to get. Uh, so um, stay tuned. <laughs> I can send an update once we figure it out. And of course, um, you know, being from development, I, uh, the idea of increasing our audiences, you know, to me, it equals um, increasing our donor base. I think that um, the advantage of being able to reach audience from the comfort of their homes cannot be understated. I find that people are much more willing to share information about our programs um, because there isn't such an inconvenience that they have to like, you know, go out of their way to come to the library or, you know, or to leave their houses, quite honestly. Not to mention that a lot of people have some extra time on their hands. Um, and I, I do think that that convenience factor has um, 
has helped to increase our audience in the greater Newark and New York City area and beyond. Um, in the, the couple programming uh, events that I was involved in, we had participants from Florida, California, and I know that um, someone from the UK just registered for our June 3rd event with author uh, Ben Taylor. Um, since the beginning, our ASL classes have attracted people from all over the country. And uh, we actually, we are planning a morning coffee afternoon tea discussion group with residents um, from Newark on the Trent in, uh, in the UK. So uh, I, since everyone is sort of stuck at home right now and, and not being able to talk to people, we thought this would be a nice way for us to, um, to you know, expand our community. Um, and, you know, in my opinion, the fact that so many more people are aware of New York Public Library and tuning in to watch our programming, it helps us to establish a larger portfolio of invested stakeholders from which we can potentially cultivate donations. So the more the merrier in my, in my purview here. So across the board, all of our social media channels have seen a huge increase in traffic over the past 10 weeks, but it's still an area we're working to understand. Um, there's a lot of data that comes in, and I think there's people at the library that understand it better than I do. Um, but evaluation of whether or not our programs are making an impact is, is something we're still looking into. Um, but to help illustrate this, I, I would like to go through a few of our slides. So Greer, if you could share the first one. Um, so this is just to tell you that, of, you know, we went from zero um, in early March to uh, 165 programs that were delivered between mid-March and mid-May, and we had over 300,000 views. So uh, that I think is pretty impressive. Um, next one, Greer. And here's just a breakdown of what our, our virtual programming has looked like. So our story times, we've had 94 since the very beginning with 90,000 views. Um, the patrons' comments, right now, that is sort of how I feel we should be evaluating our, our programming, whether or not something's really working. So it means a lot for people to make comments and to, um, and to send a little feedback our way. So, and I have to say that the majority, I think we've gotten maybe two negative comments and it, and they were just sort of not, nothing that we could control really. So again, our community story times 21, um, and we have 18,000 and I, that will increase as well because we put out another call for some more Spanish and Portuguese um, reading. Oh, which is actually is not included in this one. Sorry, my bad. We have that in a separate area. Uh, next slide. Our teen programs, we've had four teen programs um, before this was made with almost um, 4,500 views, you know, and considering how particular teens are, I, I, I feel like that's a huge success. Um, we have a really strong teen program and our librarians are, are, are well connected to that group. So um, it's nice that they're still able to stay connected and, and that the teens are showing up and, and participating. And then our Spanish and Portuguese language programs, we've had six different story times. Again, still 12,000 reviews, that's awesome. Next slide. American Sign Language classes. This has been our superstar, our, 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 um, what's the, uh, our diamond in the rough that you know we just sort of didn't expect it. Uh, Tyson, he is an he teaches classes at other places on the weekends. So when you know I knew that we weren't going to be doing anything, I asked him if he wouldn't mind having some online classes. He he has his he hosts his classes on Facebook Live, and ever since the get go, he has been. Um, he gets at least 5,000 people like tuning in during the hour that he's actually teaching. 
and then others are watching it and sharing it. So this views here, I should have kind of pointed that out. That's actually the Facebook impressions. And um, that means that people, 1,100,000, or uh, sorry, 111,000 people have either liked, shared, or made a comment on one of his seven programming. Um, so that's it really impressive. And just to put this in perspective is that from 2018 to 2019, in that entire year, we were able to go from serving 300,000 patrons to 400,000 patrons. And Tyson has been able to reach over 100,000 pa potential patrons, you know, in, over seven classes. So um, definitely he is uh, one of our superstars and his classes are great. So if you can tune in, they are every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> Next slide. Our uh, theater, literature, and poetry, we've had 25. It's been really nice. Um, this is, we had a one-man show, which uh, had about like 40 people tuning in to watch. Um, we've done uh, other poetry, uh, spoken word kind of events. We've also um, done some uh, author chats. Our new eccentric po programs have been really great. I think this one is about um, Ken Gibson's mayor. It's his 50, it's the 50th year anniversary. So that was a really nice program. Genealogy is always very popular and especially now that people have time on their hands, they can kind of delve into their family history. Next slide. Um, so here's a patron's quote that uh, MPL's virtual service skills are amazing. They provide a wonderful enriching resource for everyone and it is free. Um, so, you know, I know that that's not scientific. <laughs> and, but to me, I think that we, considering, again, that we went from zero to um, 65 in a matter of seven weeks, I feel very happy about where we are now. And I'm excited about where we're going because every day we keep learning new skills and, um, and new avenues for us to kind of uh, explore. So in closing, I'd like to reiterate the amazing team that I have the privilege of working with at the New York Public Library. Across the board and in every department, they are truly dedicated to our community, have a passion for sharing knowledge, and are always willing to try something new. So it is their success that we are celebrating today, and I think they deserve a virtual round of applause. So thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> thank you so much, Kirsten, and a virtual round, in, round of applause indeed. I wish we could, we could do that somehow here. Um, that was wonderful. Um, so I'm pleased now to announce our, our next speaker, um, Nicole Bellolin. Um, from the Mid-Atlantic um, Regional Center for the Humanities. Um, and I did want to uh, make one correction on my introduction earlier. Nicole is the acting director of March. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that clear. I think I um, had a misstep in my earlier introduction. Um, so without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Nicole. Thanks, Greer. Can everyone hear me? Someone give me an indication. You can hear me? We can hear you. Excellent, thanks Greer. And um, yes, thank you. I didn't want everyone to think I gave myself a promotion <laughs> while my boss is away. <laughs> All right, well, thanks so much to uh, NJ Humanities and the Historical Commission for inviting me here today to share some resources with all of you. I hope you'll share some resources with me too. I've already learned a bunch from Kirsten's presentation. So thanks so much uh, for organizing this. I'm gonna be talking about accessibility and digital programming. And I've broken this presentation down into three main topics, accessibility, history, civil rights and inclusion, and quick tips for providing accessible digital programming. 
And these are tips that I've accumulated over the years and have built, built into my own practice of public history, which of course is very applicable to other humanities organizations. I wanna stay on this slide for now, and I want to just ask you all to think about either to yourselves or feel free to share it in the chat as well. Answer this question, what does accessibility mean to you? What are different types of accessibility? We're talking today mostly about accessibility for people with disabilities, but I want us all to think about this in terms of other types of access too. So financial accessibility is a form of accessibility. Can your audience afford the program? And can you afford the program? <laughs> Don't forget about your own capacity as well. Physical and programmatic access are super important, especially as it relates to people with disabilities, and we'll talk more about that today. Can they experience what you are offering fully and independently? Platforms, as Kirsten went through, uh, different people use different platforms to access the web. There are a couple people on this call who are on the phone, for example. There are people who are accessing it uh, using their computer, probably some a desktop, some using a smartphone perhaps. There are lots of ways to do it. Um, some people, when it comes to social media, prefer Twitter versus Facebook or Instagram versus uh, something else. Um, I know there's a new thing out there called TikTok that I, I have yet to experiment with. So these are all things to keep in mind. Uh, it's great to provide your programming on a variety of platforms if you can, or to figure out which one is best for your content. Language is a form of accessibility, which I think somebody mentioned in the chat. Lots of you are mentioning other types of accessibility as well. So as Kirsten provided some great examples, I think she said they're doing programming in Spanish and Portuguese. I assume that means she is in a community with a large Spanish and Portuguese population. So pay attention to that sort of accessibility too. There's cultural access. Are your programs titled in a way that avoid jargon? Accessibility is, is, a, is jargon in and of itself. Are you providing programs for your audiences that people are gonna respond to and get excited about or um, are you using professional, professional jargon? Try to avoid that if you can. When I talk about this in terms of in-person activities, there are many people who have never been to a museum or know how to quote unquote act in a gallery setting. And so these are things to keep in mind when you're designing your programming. So you can try to reach as many different types of people as you can. Another example of accessibility when it comes to cultural accessibility, are you offering your program at the right time of day or right, right time of night? Um, to attract as many people as possible or to attract the group that you're trying to, to get in touch with. So today we're talking mostly about accessibility as it relates to people with disabilities. And that can be people with sensory impairments, people who have cognitive disabilities, intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities. There's a whole range of types of disabilities we can talk about. And we won't go into too much detail about physical disability to, disability today simply because we're talking mostly about online stuff. But ke always keep in mind that accessibility is not just about people, poor people with disabilities, it benefits everybody. And also keep in mind uh, terminology, which I'll bring up again later. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be talking about how in person, for example, we typically um, want to encourage people to use microphones for lectures for public events. And I was giving this tip to a group a couple months ago in person, and they came up to me afterward and said, you know, uh, this person was significantly, I believe, significantly older than I am and said, you know, people like me, this older person, um, we have a hard time hearing too, so microphones are great for us also. And that was a big light bulb moment for me that somebody who is um, from an older age cohort and is either deaf or hard of hearing might not necessarily identify as being a person with a disability. So we can go to the next slide, Greer, if you have a second to do that. Thank you. One of the best practices when it comes to disability is describing everything that you see 
on the screen. So the people who uh, have their are phoning in today will benefit from this and so will you know the rest of us too. So I should have started by telling you that all of my slides have black background and white text and this particular slide says disability at the top and there's a photograph credit at the bottom for the National Archives and there's a color photograph in the middle that I'll talk about in a second. I'm going to start today by talking a bit about disability history since I am a historian and I think talking about the history of accessibility and accommodations and access to culture will help put our practice into some sort of historical context. Many of you are probably familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act known as the ADA. It was passed in 1994. This photograph is a color photograph picturing George H.W. Bush signing that into law on a brown table. There, he's seated and there are two men seated next to him in wheelchairs and there's a priest behind him and a woman looking over his shoulder. And they are in front of a big fountain and a green space and behind them is a blurry group of people. The ADA stipulates that all individuals with disabilities have the right to public and private access of everyday activities. But I want you to know that if you're not already aware, people with disabilities practice access to culture for literally thousands of years. So this is not a new thing, but because of the way society worked, this is something that we had to literally write into the law. You can go into that history another time or <laughs> on the phone or via email if you want. I'm going to say a couple of things about law, but I'm not an attorney. Just want to throw that out there. So you should consult with a lawyer if you have any specific questions about uh, ADA compliance. But do keep in mind that disability rights are civil rights. We are legally obligated to provide physical and programmatic access to our sites and to programming. And we're ethically obligated to do this also. As stewards of cultural heritage and the humanities, uh, we are expected to preserve what we have and also to provide access to it. And we should all be compelled to take this a step further to make our sites inclusive for everybody. Uh, this is a concept that is sometimes coupled with the term universal design, which is actually termed in 19, coined in 1958. A lot of advocates in the disability rights community will say that the ADA is the bare minimum. So just uh, keep that in mind as, as something to strive for, to go, to go even beyond what the ADA is asking us to do. We are going to stay on this slide for a moment, and I'm going to go on a little bit more about inclusion. And just to say and to reiterate that accessibility is an ethical imperative. It's also a legal requirement. It's not just about people with disabilities. Everybody benefits from disability, from accessibility measures, whether or not they relate to people with disabilities or those other types of access that we were talking about when we first started. And ideally, your practice of accessibility will also take into consideration this idea of inclusion, the idea that you're not just making things available, but that people can engage with your content independently. We can move on to the next slide. And this slide says quick tips for accessible programming. So now I'm going to go through just that quick tips for accessible programming and I've broken them up into four basic categories, technology, communication, media and platforms, and inclusion. These are all things I try to keep in mind whenever I'm doing some sort of program or working with somebody who's doing a program. So remember when you partner with someone too to try to make sure you're on the same page about this as well. So I'm gonna start with technology. One thing you can uh, consider doing if you haven't already is create what's known as a know before you go guide. If you're not familiar with these, Google know before you go museum or know before you go library and you'll get a couple of good examples out of that. And this will often say things like, uh, we have wheelchair access at X entrance or Y entrance, or we have restrooms here, or we have accessible restrooms here. 
um, we provide sign language interpretation. There are a lot of different way things that you can include on a know before you go guide. Think about transforming some of these things into the digital realm when it comes to your digital programming also. Are there things that you can let your participants know like we did here today about this program? Will there be a transcript provided? Will there be a recording of the session provided? Uh, will there be some sort of uh, interpretation or captioning? Optimize technology on your end and that of on your participants. So there are a couple different ways to do this. If you are participating in a webinar like this one, if you can have a wired internet connection, that I am told <laughs> makes your internet connection more reliable. Uh, do try to do test runs. We all did that uh, yesterday for this webinar and then again this morning and that helped us all iron out some questions and make sure we're all on the same page. For uh, speakers, it's great to have a headset. If you have one, they tend to uh, block out more ambient noise, so you probably cannot hear the masons who are working <laughs> at our neighbor's house or you know the, the train that's going by every half hour or so. So that helps everybody um, here and concentrate better. And also, if you can, try to offer tech tests for technology tests for your own audience beforehand so that they're comfortable with the technology before they dive into it. Lots of different places are using lots of different uh, platforms that are new to people who are not already working in the humanities. And uh, some places are using Zoom, for example, some are using WebEx, some are using GoToMeeting, and uh, they all have different requirements and, and different, as you know, uh, quirks to them. So I'm going to move into communication now. Always provide uh, printed versions of your content when you can, and try to use a sans serif typeface like Arial, that's what I'm using here today and use 16 point typeface or larger. This is easier to read for many people. And on a related note, if you, depending on whether or not this is an in-person event or a digital event, circulate text or takeaways or resources or slides ahead of time if you can. This could help people follow along. Mm -hmm. In person, you might do this with physical copies. When you're posting something to your website or to uh, social media, mostly your website since it's hard to do this on social media, make sure you're providing both a PDF and a Word document. And make sure that PDF is enabled uh, for screen readers to go through the text. The reason you want to provide both a PDF and a Word document, I am told, is because people who are blind or, or who have low vision tend to prefer one or the other. There are different ways that people expand the text so that they can read it more easily. And so it's always great to provide both. Review the language that you're using when you're talking about or referring to people with disabilities. I included a resource on language that I sent to Greer, which um, I think she might have included on the handout. If you don't see it there, just let me know. Um, there are some words you might be accustomed to using like handicapped that are actually generally considered outdated now. Language is always changing. I am personally always going back to this website to make sure that I'm using language to refer to people with disabilities that most people are happy with. That said, there are a lot of people who prefer different things. I was on a panel a couple years ago with two uh, people who are uh, disabled. One person preferred the term disabled person, one person preferred the term people with disabilities. So just keep in mind that this is an evolving thing and that's just something to pay attention to. Also in terms of communication, when you can provide transcripts for things like podcasts and videos, describe images, spaces, and places in full. That's something that I've been trying to do throughout this presentation. Consider CART, C-A-R-T, Transcription Services. That stands for Communication Access Real-Time Translation. It's essentially real-time captioning. As I think um, Kirsten said earlier, nothing automated really beats this yet. I like to provide uh, my own transcripts 
uh, because uh, it gives me an opportunity to also include extra information I might have forgotten to include in the final video that I've posted. So it's a great way to, to insert things you've forgotten or an enhanced experience for people. Provide American Sign Language Interpretation upon request. It's not redundant with CART. Um, American Sign Language is not English, just to keep that in mind. I have not used them myself, and I think this came up earlier in the chat. Um, there are transcription apps that can be integrated with Zoom. Uh, you can check these out at this website. A great resource for doing online programming is instructional design at uh, universities. So for example, um, this is a historian's website. Oops, I sent that to Greer privately. <laughs> Let me try again. Here we go. Uh, and they mention uh, two apps under uh, if your course is lecture-based, and these apparently can be integrated with Zoom conferencing. I have not tried these myself. I just wanted to let you know they were out there. And I also listened in on a webinar a couple weeks ago about uh, accessibility and conferencing in particular, and there was a big focus on captioning and uh, sign language interpretation. And I just sent you that YouTube of that program. So if you want to dive a little more deeper into this, that's probably one place you might want to look. Now we're going to move on to media and platforms. And Greer, if you could move on to the next slide, that would be great. Thanks. So this slide says styles and alternative text. And I have two screenshots, one on the left, one on the right. The one on the left is of a Word document I was working on a couple days ago for this webinar. And on the right, it's a screenshot of uh, the PowerPoint that I was preparing for all of you. And the point here is that you wanna make sure that you are using styles in all of your Word documents. And styles create headings and tags that make it easier uh, for uh, screen readers to go through your Word documents and your PDF documents. And just do go through the help in Word and it will show you how to use those. If you don't like the way they look, you can change the color of the, the typeface or change the typeface uh, to your liking. And that's what that screenshot is showing on the left. On the right, we have a screenshot of the PowerPoint. And you can see that when you, uh, right click or do the equivalent of a right click on a Mac on the image, it gives you an opportunity to edit what's called alt text, alternative text. And that means, it's a little bit misleading, uh, you simply describe what you're seeing there so that again, if somebody who's blind or has low vision is going through your document with a screen reader, they will be able to access that, that content. This is something that you can also do on social media. Most platforms now let you provide alternative text. So Twitter and Instagram, for example, let you do this quite easily through their apps. On your websites, and well, actually, uh, and your handouts and, and everything that's digital or not digital, stuff that's in person as well, check the contrast of your colors to make sure you're using uh, things that are of high contrast. And Greer, you can go back to this slide. Yep, that one is great. So for example, black and white, pretty straightforward. Uh, there is a resource on the list that goes to a website called web, like internet web, aim, like I have an aim to do something. And you can put in the colors and it will tell you if they are of high enough contrast for accessibility purposes. And if you're uh, stuck on how to do that, let me know, I'm happy to help out. If you're building or updating your website, a lot of us use WordPress, not everybody, a lot of us do. They have templates that are marked accessible and responsive. And these are not foolproof tags, but chances are they are better than nothing. So try to use those templates if you can. Uh, that does not mean you don't have to provide alternative text for your images, though. There's, there are things that you will have to do yourself. And that's a good thing. You know, it makes you a better interpreter of the content that you're providing. To conclude, I want to talk a little bit more about inclusion, how you can bring all this together. 
uh, interpret disability history if it's appropriate for your organization, if it's missions-based or collections-based, if you're a collecting institution, or if you are a nonprofit and you happen to be in a building that has some disability history associated with it, using, telling, talking about disability history is a form of accessibility too. Go the extra mile, mile, make it customary for everybody to be inclusive, not just accessible. You wanna be providing full independent access to content. And I just wanna to reiterate today that we haven't talked much about physical accessibility because of the nature of what we're doing right now, but I'm happy to talk more about that today or, or another time or offline. Go the extra mile and make it customary to be inclusive, not just accessible. Uh, I just said that. <laughs> I wanted to make sure you, you got that. Um, there are many great examples of museums, historic sites, other humanities organizations, libraries, uh, as Kirsten showed us today, who are improving their access to content for people with disabilities. Check out what they're doing. Check out their websites. Better yet, send them an email, spend 10 minutes on the phone with them. They will be able to give you some tips and tricks uh, I'm sure there are many that have come through on the chat that we can all benefit from as well. I'm constantly learning new things. Assess your accessibility procedures and a plan if you have one um, with people with disabilities. Include them in on the planning process. I am not a person, I don't consider myself to be a person with disability, so I really need that feedback. And then make sure that when you evaluate your programs, ask about access and accessibility. Maybe not use that word because that's not one that lots of people are familiar with. Um, but make sure that people are getting your content. Be the squeaky wheel in your organization or the people you're working with. Add a question to the end of every checklist or planning document for any program and ask yourself, is this as accessible and as inclusive as we can make it? And finally, talk about or hold a meeting about what you discussed in this webinar. Share the information, tell people what you learned today, make it a part of your organization's culture to talk about accessibility broadly defined. And I hope that uh, you will use this as an opportunity to up your game uh, when it comes to accessibility online and that when we are back in person, we will think about accessibility physically as well and how the two are, are integrated. Happy to take questions uh, now or in another time. I believe my email and phone number have been provided. Uh, please do get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Thank, Thank you, Nicole. So much, Nicole. Thank you so much. So we have um, really explored a lot of fantastic information. I don't know about any of you, but I feel like the time just flew by. And we've got about 15 minutes left, give or take a few minutes, um, for Q&A. And um, we've been recording, keeping track of all of the questions that came from the, the start of today's webinar. And we'll go through and start to address them. Um, so I'll share some information and then we'll hear more from Kirsten and Nicole. Uh, so let's take a look. A few things um, that are specific to Newark Public Library and um, I have to give a shout out to Tom who's doing a great job fielding information um, and just wanted to be sure since there were so many questions about it to reinforce that the Newark Public Library online programs are available to anyone with an internet connection and that you don't have to have library card, um, that the census program information is available to anyone that but an internet connection is required. And Tom also mentioned that a lot of the programs are 30 to 90 minutes and the recordings are available um, on npl.org and it's the virtual programs tab. Another thing, another question that came early that I want to just circle back to really fast is that Sarah did post the link for that survey um, and that'll be sent out in resources as well. So one of the questions that we had, um, panelists, you mentioned conducting social media programs for all people. Is there a computer program or system that you've used that will automatically transfer live or recorded events into closed captioning for those members of the public that are hearing impaired? I know we heard from Nicole regarding some of those resources um, and there were some links put in there um, as well as a link to CART 
that you referred to, Nicole. Is there anything else that either of our panelists would want to add to that regarding that um, service? Not that I know of. I, I, I'm, uh, we haven't really experimented with the Google Meet or um, Microsoft Team. Th those two um, do the closed captioning automatically for you, but I don't know whether or not you can link that so that it's, it's um, also broadcast on Facebook Live or Instagram. So I, I, I can look into that though, for sure. Well, and that actually ties to another question. Um, and this is for the panelists, or if there's anyone um, that could use the chat function that would want to weigh in, has anyone had any luck using the Zoom platform, but putting it up on Facebook Live? Yes, we have. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so there's a, when you go in to kind of create your program, your, your meeting, there, if you go into the advanced settings, there is a spot that you can have it um, broadcast live on Facebook. So we've used that a couple times for our programming. We actually just used it last night um, for our board meeting um, to help make sure that was a little more accessible. Um, and what's great is that we actually, we had forgotten that we had a, um, the teen program was scheduled for last night and she was still able to do her Facebook live while the board meeting continued past 7 p.m. So um, I'm not exactly sure that's like the magic of Facebook, but uh, <laughs> that was great to know as well. Um, Excellent. Thank you, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. Um, at the, so this was a question from Jane at the Montclair History Center. Um, at the center, they've launched a robust schedule of weekly Zoom presentations, which are recorded. They've been incredibly well attended. Congrats, Jane. And it's opened our eyes to how necessary virtual presentations will be going forward. We're mm -hmm. often asked if we'll be posting the recordings, but we have hesitated because we like to keep this Zoom attendee pictures up so people get more of social connection as well. What's your opinion of us posting these recordings, which may show thumbnail size Zoom photos of the attendees to our YouTube channel? Huh, interesting. I wonder if you can edit that out. Um, because we, if, if Tom is still on, he, um, we post, all of our programs, they are recorded and then we post them to our YouTube channel. And I know that um, we've been Zoom bombed a few times. And, but mostly it's in the beginning, we can kind of figure out who the troublemakers are and remove them from the program before we actually get started. So I'm not sure, I know that he edits that, that, that you don't see that when you watch one of our videos. Um, but as far as showing, sh yeah, showing who's participating or who's in the audience, I'm not sure about that. Nicole, do you have any experience or? I haven't uh, tried this myself, but I'm just thinking of ways you might try to figure it out. Um, you could try to edit them out as you're suggesting, which might be easier to do depending on how, what your speaker view looks like on the recording end. Um, another option is you could, you obviously still want to get that social interaction if you can. So you could have a section of the meeting that is just the presentation, but then you have a separate maybe discussion where you bring up videos that you edit out of the final product that you put up on the web. And then the, of course, the other option is to get people to sign off on having their likeness in a video. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the, the things that come to mind first. Well, and, and actually that brings up a really good point as far as likeness being used in video. Um, are you addressing that ahead of time? Are there disclaimers that you're using? Because it is a little different than before when you would have someone sign off on a film notice or filming release. Um, our take at the library is if you are attending a public program, then you 
then it's kind of fair game that we are, what might take your picture, that we might record it, that it might show up as well. We, I've been in a couple incident, instances, sorry, um, where uh, a parent has, you know, asked that their child in particular not be included in any of the photographs, which, you know, if someone approaches us like that, we, we certainly listen, but otherwise, and, and I think we've run this by our, our PR firm who helps us too, is that it's, it's a public program. So um, it, it's more on their onus to tell us not to take pictures of them or include them in our pictures. But, you know, that could just be the way we roll. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and I mean, I think one of the big takeaways from everything that's happening is that there is this this new level of learning, right? Like looking at different issues that might not have seemed as pressing uh, pre-COVID, but now, you know, it's, it's, it's more stuff that we get to learn. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we still have uh, a few more questions. So I'm gonna head back to the question list. Um, and I also wanted to mention that one of the respondents, um, one of the participants actually wanted to note that you can run a pre-recorded video through Microsoft Stream or YouTube to create your captions and you'll have the ability to edit and um, you can download a caption file that can be used on several platforms. So that was a comment that came through regarding um, some of that captioning. There was also um, a budget question that I wanted to pose to the um, panelists. Uh, one of the participants said we had tremendous attendance for our online programs and it only took a global pandemic for our board to start doing webinars exclamation point that made me chuckle uh, looking ahead are you reworking budgets to include continued online outreach even when the doors reopen are you tracking hours spent in these tasks to offset against pre-covid duties any advice on how we work with these programs into a long long-term plan without collapsing from exhaustion. Michelle, you made me talk, chuckle twice. So participants, or I'm sorry, um, panelists. Um, well, we just had our discussion about our summer hours because usually in the summer when the library is open, we um, only have one late night on Wednesdays and we uh, only, we're only open for a few hours on Saturdays as well, but it was decided or it was discussed amongst our board meeting last night that virtual programming doesn't fall into that category and it can continue um, any day of the week or on the weekends as well. How we c compensate that, I mean, I think if you can be flex with people's schedules and you know, you know that they're doing a 7 p.m. program so they, you know, can sort of work their hours differently. Um, it, I, yeah, I'm not really sure how that works staff-wise. Uh, luckily, I haven't had to deal with any of that yet, but I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. So um, one final wrap up question, how are you doing staff wise? You know, how are you doing with your coworkers, colleagues, board, you know, with COVID and all of the communication changes and that kind of thing? Um, is there, what's that experience been like so far? Any lessons learned or surprises? Nicole, do you want to answer? <laughs> I was just trying to think of what my response is. Um, my work with the National Council on Public History was 99% uh, remote anyway. Um, so I was sort of used to all this <laughs> already, at least the, the Zoom meeting thing. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't... Um, it, has, it hasn't really changed a whole lot for me yet, except that I've been drawn into more conversations like 
this one. So I guess actually I've been personally engaging more with my colleagues and the community on topics related to this than I have previously. Um, at Rutgers, uh, we are sort of in crisis mode at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. So communication in general has been difficult, understandably so. Uh, that wasn't a very helpful <laughs> response. <laughs> It's definitely given me an opportunity to try to master new skills. So, well, and and, and both of you mentioned like new skill sets coming up in different ways and identifying some of those skill sets. So, I what I'm hearing is very much um, from your organizations and organizations across the state this real like resourcefulness. That, that has now become this strength that so many organizations are leaning into because it's, everything is so unprecedented. Um, well, ladies, thank you so much for your time and your willingness to share your expertise um, and share what's been going on about, um, you know, since before COVID, since COVID and I feel like, you know, we even started to address some of what life looks like post COVID here. So thank you so much. I, I feel like I can hear all, uh, you know, there's over a hundred people listening to you right now and I can hear them all clapping across the state of New Jersey. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for putting it together. So we're going to turn things over to Greer for wrap up. Well, um, I'm just echoing Angela's um, comments. Thank you both so much. Um, and from the Historical Commission, thank you to, to Angela and to, to your team at the, the Council for the Humanities for being such great partners. Um, in conclusion, um, I just wanted to reiterate, um, we do have a resource list and I saw some additional resources come through the chat while, you know, throughout the, the course of this um, presentation. So I'll try and add those in um, relevant resources into our list before we send it out. Um, and we'll also send out the, um, the PowerPoint and presentation recording. Um, so that will be sent out to you via email, um, but we will also post it on the Historical Commission's website, which is history.nj.gov, um, as well as the Council for the Humanities website. Um, Angela, I don't know, I've, it's njhumanities.org, is that it? Correct. Okay, great. Um, and then um, finally, uh, mark your calendars. Um, we have um, two uh, great upcoming webinars, one in June and one in July. Um, the June webinar, the topic will be creating programs in a digital world. So uh, delving, I think, in more detail into, you know, some of the platforms and how do you take you know, a, a program that you normally hold in person and transition that into a, to a digital um, format. Um, and then our second um, webinar in, or a third rather, webinar in July will be um, a little broader in topic, kind of expanding beyond the digital engagement topic. Um, and it will be long-term strategies for resilience, considering revenues, costs, and business models. Um, and both of those webinars will be held from 1030 um, to noon, just like this one. Um, so, Thank you all um, so much again for, for taking the time to, to be with us today and thank you to our wonderful speakers. Um, and Angela, did you want to say any final um, welcome or conclusion, <laughs> concluding remarks, I should say? Um, I just really appreciate everyone's involvement and participation. It's so important to keep the conversation going. That's how we pick up new information, new resources, and we, we end up sharing the things that we've already learned to benefit uh, not just other organizations, but everyone's, um, everyone's contribution is really adding to the strength of the cultural infrastructure of our state, um, which is what makes our state unique, uh, wonderful, and uh, my favorite place to be. So with that, um, thank you so much for your participation, especially to our panelists, um, Nicole and Kirsten. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. And if there were any, uh, any pressing questions or things that pop up later, the conversation hasn't ended. You'll have all of our emails. Um, please uh, shoot an email. Mm -hmm.
pick up the phone. We're happy to talk this through and keep, keep those important dialogues open and going. So thank you.